joining us tonight. My name is Faye, Knight and Faye Knights and I am the Education Program Coordinator at Crohn's and Colitis Canada. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to moderate tonight's webinar and to learn more from our special medical guest speaker, Dr. Remo Penichone. I'd like to start by outlining some of today's webinar logistics. Today's education webinar on current and emerging therapies for Crohn's and colitis is made possible through an unrestricted grant from Takeda. Some of you may be new to webinars, so I'll quickly run through how you can ask questions. Right now, everyone is muted so that everyone can hear the speaker and so that we do not run into any webinar noise interference and we can record the webinar for future viewing. If you look at the left side of your screen in the middle, you will see a field that says questions. You can type your questions here at any time throughout the duration of the presentation. When our guest speaker is finished, questions will be randomly selected from the chat box for the question and answer period. If you have a technical question, you can also type this here in the chat box. We will follow up with you directly to see if there's anything we can do to assist. But please be advised that this webinar is going to be recorded um, and works best in high speed internet connections. If you do happen to be doc if you do happen to be disconnected or run into technical difficulties, a recording will be available on our YouTube channel at Get Gutsy in the following week. I'd like to now begin our presentation by sharing some information about Crohn's and Colitis Canada. Crohn's and Colitis Canada, formerly known as Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of Canada, was established in 1974 by a group of concerned parents of children with inflammatory bowel disease. We are a national charity dedicated to finding treatments and cures for Crohn's and colitis and are dedicated to educating individuals living with these chronic diseases, their loved ones, and the public. We want the public to be aware of the toll that these chronic diseases are taking on nearly a quarter of a million Canadians. To date, Crohn's and Colitis Canada has funded over 88 million in research. That makes us one of the largest funders of Crohn's and Colitis research in the world and we have over 65,000 supporters, many of whom are, are actively involved in 80 chapters across Canada. Today's webinar is part of Crohn's and Colitis Canada's education programs, which include local in-person education events, patient brochures, online resources, and live webcasts. Our education materials cover a variety of medical, social, and psychological topics. More specifically, our brochures provide information varying on ostomy care, fertility, helping children cope, surgery, and nutrition. If you would like more information about Crohn's and Colitis Canada or to view copies of our downloadable education brochures, please visit our website at www.crohnsandcolitis.ca. I'm pleased now to introduce to you our guest speaker, Dr. Remo Penichone. Dr. Remo Penichone is an internationally recognized expert in inflammatory bowel disease. He is an associate professor in the Department of Medicine, the director of the Inflammatory Bowel Disease Clinic, ranked one of the top five in the world. Dr. Penichone's special interests lie in the implementation of, per of performance of clinical, sorry, of clinical, clinical trials of new therapies in IBD, and he also performs research in identifying new targets to develop new, new therapies in IBD. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Penachone. Thanks, Faye, and welcome everyone uh, to tonight's webinar. Um, over the next uh, sort of 40 to 45 minutes, uh, what I'll do is take you through some of the uh, sort of current and emerging therapies uh, in inflammatory bowel disease and more importantly, probably try to guide you through some of the decision-making processes and some of the maybe obstacles or barriers in decision-making uh, that we encounter as physicians and, and that probably questions you should ask your physician when you're trying to make these important decisions. 
So I'm just going to start about start with some motherhood statements regarding sort of the treatment of inflammatory bowel disease and what it means to be an inflammatory bowel disease patient. So the first thing is to really empower yourself. I, I'm a big believer that uh, patients are partners uh, in the decision-making process, um, but to, in order to make those decisions, you need to gather knowledge from reputable sources. Uh, you need to expect more from your treatment. We're going to talk a lot about that. And you, have, you should have an, your own personal goal on what it means to be normal or what a normal quality of life is. So one of the challenges is always trying to get the most in, your information from reputable sources. So some of you out there do a lot of surfing on the internet, for example. And as we all know, that anyone can put anything they want on the internet. So make sure that the information that you're getting is from reputable sources. The other thing is it's very difficult, and we recognize this as physicians, that when you have a new diagnosis or when you've been struggling with a chronic disease, that it's easy to sort of get down on yourself and give up on your dreams and aspirations. And this is something that you don't ever want to let go of. Certainly from you know, almost 20 years of experience taking care of patients with inflammatory bowel disease, I recognize that some of the patients that do uh, the best as far as their overall, uh, overall disease is concerned are those patients that, that hold on to dreams, aspirations, and they always have life goals and they don't let the disease get in their way. And then the last one is something that I truly, uh, again, believe in is find yourself a good physician. And this really takes two parts. Uh, one, someone who's knowledgeable. This field is changing dramatically. Um, it will continue to change uh, dramatically uh, in the next uh, several years. And that's why, um, along with Crohn's Colitis Canada, a group of physicians across the country are trying to establish an IBD network that can be resources to community gastroenterologists to ensure that regardless of where you live, that you'll, be, you'll have some sort of contact with the latest information in breast best practices on how to manage your disease. But equally important is your relationship with a physician is going to be a lifelong relationship. So you want to be in the care of someone that you personally get along with uh, and you can talk to and you feel that you're being heard. Um, just as all patient personalities are different, all physician personalities are different, and you want to make sure that you, can, you have that good fit. Some of the things that I tell patients not to do or what are the don'ts of being an IBD patient, the first one is really don't compare yourself to other patients. Uh, different patients have different experiences and certainly patients who are diagnosed in 2015, we, our expectations is that their, their own journey with the disease will be much different than patients, for example, that were diagnosed in the 1970s because treatment options and the understanding of the disease is much different. The other thing is don't treat yourself. Always think about this as a partnership. Uh, there are many therapies out there. There are many alternative therapies out there that patients seek. And I always tell patients, even though I don't have all the answers, if this is a partnership, then make sure that we're treating your disease together instead of having one person drive and the other one being blind along the journey. And never lose hope. Uh, one of the things, the reason that I do what I do uh, in my academic life is that I think that there's always room for growth in new treatments and new ways to manage the disease. And with that, we hope to give hope to patients who have the disease, established disease and for those who are going to be diagnosed in the future. So the bottom line is, with this whole presentation, is take control of your disease and don't let the disease control you. To understand where we're going to go, these are key messages that, that we established several years ago that I think is very, are very important for patients to understand when they're making decisions in their management strategy. The first one is that we know that both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis in the majority of patients, 70% or so, are chronic progressive diseases. This means that inflammation will drive some of the complications that we associate with these diseases and the whole goal should be to control inflammation. Surgery is not necessarily the solution for these diseases. Even in, in patients with ulcerative colitis, where we say that, the, that if we take out the large intestine that you're cured, it really isn't a cure because you are left with some 
uh, deficiency in your overall quality of life. This is probably the most important shift is point number three in the management is although you as a patient live your disease based on your symptoms on a day-to-day -day base on a day-to-day -day basis, the, our goals of therapy have evolved beyond treating just symptoms. It's not just enough to control your diarrhea or con control your abdominal pain because we know that there's a disconnect between your symptoms and if you have active disease. We'll talk about that. Not all the drugs that we have historically achieve our treatment goals, and that's why we, that's why we have more and more patients on some of these newer therapies. And, these, and in point number five, some of these newer therapies work better if you use them in combination with some of the older drugs. We also know that with any type of drug therapy, um, especially some of the newer drug therapy, that treating early has its benefits, and that we've shifted to make sure that we don't treat all patients the same and that certain patients will have factors that will determine whether they're going to be a good actor over time or a bad actor over time. And instead of having patients go from one therapy to another, we try to choose the most appropriate therapy based on some of these prognostic factors. We like to monitor your disease because of the reasons I said earlier that symptoms are, are just are not the only important thing. And if you really have good relationship with your doctor, you need to understand that your doctor does think about the benefits and risks when recommending a therapeutic approach. We understand those benefits and we understand that the risks that we may outline associated with these therapies do exist. There's an emotional response to these risks, but we wouldn't be recommending therapy if we really thought that those risks outweighed the benefits. And the last point, which is probably the hardest, the one thing that we always, always to drive home is that this is a chronic disease. You need to find the right recipe to control your disease. And when you find that the right recipe, don't stop therapy that works. It's always, always the allure that when you're feeling well and you've been in remission for a long period of time, that you can look back and say, well, why am I taking this medication? I feel completely well. Just remember where you started on that journey and why you're well at that time. It's probably because of some sort of management strategy that's gone, gotten you there, and you want to continue that. So for years, there's been unmet needs in the management of inflammatory bowel disease. We want drugs that rapidly relieve symptoms. Importantly, in 2015, we want to avoid steroids. We want to make the lining of the bowel better. We want you to have a normal quality of life and we want sustained efficacy for the long term. So we want to get you better quickly, but that's only winning the sprint. The more important thing is to win the mar marathon and be able to control you over the long term. And by doing that, hopefully we'll avoid surgery and hospitalization. So one size doesn't fit all. You're all a bit different. You're all going to have different management strategies, but there's certain underpinnings in management strategies that we can talk about. And this is the overall management approach that you sh we should think about. So we start by thinking about you as an individual patient. What are the factors or criteria that you have as an individual patient that allows us to tell you or try to predict what your course is going to be? And that's these predictors of disease course and response. Following that, we really want to know what, whoops, what kind of treatment targets are there out there. And then we develop a treatment algorithm and a monitoring algorithm. So it's not just about drug therapy. It's a constellation of all of these. So let's start with what we know about some of these predictors of, of uh, disease course. Why should we use this? The best thing that we can say, it's about selecting the right treatment for the right patient at the right time. In the audience uh, tonight, there's going to be a variety of patients out there that have factors that put them at low risk of progression, and there's other pa others of you out there that will have high, high risk of progression. If you have low risk of progression, and we can predict that, then using some of the newer agents, or what we call a top-down strategy, may over-treat you and expose, to, expose you to costs and the risks of immunosuppression. On the other hand, if you have a high risk of progression and we just start with 
you know, the first line therapy that may sound safe and then go to the next level and then the next level, we're really postponing adequate therapy. And in patients who have an aggressive disease course, it may be too late when you introduce the most appropriate therapy. And there's a shopping list, and I'm not going to go over this, of things that predict whether you're going to be a good actor or a bad actor, both in Crohn's disease here and in ulcerative colitis. And we've taken this a little further. So this is uh, some, this, uh, just to give you an idea of what we can do with some of these inputs. Uh, this is something that's developed by a friend of mine in the United States named Corey Siegel, where we can take certain factors, they could be personal characteristics, where your disease is, what your blood work shows. If you have genetic information, you can add that. And we can sort of model what would happen. So here, for example, in this particular patient, in the green line, what you see is what the risk of complication would be if you didn't treat patients. And in fact, in this patient, starting steroids, like prednisone, would actually increase that risk of complication. Or we can do this. This would be an adolescent girl. This would be what we would predict her course to be uh, if she was on no treatment. If we added an immunosuppressant early in her course, this is what we think that we, how we can modify the disease. Or if we added an early anti-TNF, uh, a drug like um, Remicade or Humira or Symphony. So we're starting to learn more and more on how to predict what patients are going to do, what their risk is, and how they may respond to therapy. The next thing I've already alluded to in those first 10 message, messages is treatment targets. And these treatment tar targets have evolved over time. As an IBD patient, most of you, when you sit in front of us, want us to improve your symptoms. Now, if you think that two of the cardinal uh, symptoms of the disease are abdominal pain and diarrhea, well, that's pretty easy. You can improve those symptoms uh, yourself sometimes. You can go to the pharmacy, take an anti-diarrheal. Um, you can go to your family doctor. He can give you something for pain. And now your pain and your diarrhea are improved but we've done nothing to treat your disease. We're only improving your symptoms. At the very least, we want you to come back to normal. We want you to be in clinical remission without the need for steroids. But what has evolved is this whole concept of disease control, trying to heal the damaged bowel, make it look back to normal, because we know if we can do that, we can avoid treatment, I mean, we can avoid complications of the disease. So our treatment strategies need to evolve as your treatment goals evolve. So you should sit down with your physicians and always discuss what your goals are. Different patients have different goals, but you should go forward in a partnership once these goals have been established. And this is part of shared decision making, where it is the process where you interact uh, with patients who wish to be involved with their healthcare providers in making medical decisions. Now, you can imagine that out there, there's very different uh, types of patients. Uh, there's patients who really take a passive role. They really prefer to leave all the decision regarding treatment to their physicians. There's the ones that take an active role. They prefer to make the decision uh, about which treatment they'll receive. And there's the collaborative role where you prefer that you, both your doctor and yourself share the responsibility for deciding which treatment is best for you. And certainly, this is the type of model that we want, is for there to be a mutual understanding and a back and forth discussion on why you should be on a certain therapies, what your fears may be, what is that sweet spot that we've picked the right therapy, not only that gets you better, but psychologically you're accepting of. There is this whole issue of what we call decisional conflict, and, and some of you fall into this bucket where you're presented a whole bunch of options and you're uncertain about what to do. There's way too much information. Um, you, you don't want to make that decision. And we can actually measure this sometimes about how comfortable people are. And so when somebody walks out of the office, for example, I know which ones are actually going to go on therapy, take therapy, or delay therapy, because it's easy to identify patients who have a decisional conflict uh, in your office. And in the end, what they do is they, you have to ask your, ask, we have to ask the question, does the patient want to do it? If you don't identify this, um, there's a lot of 
problems that happen when that patient leaves your office. Uh, they're about 60 times more likely to change their mind when they leave, 23 times more likely to delay a decision. Uh, they, if they do make a decision, they're more likely to regret it. Um, if you gave them the information and they can't really make it and you give them a test, they're more likely to fail that test. And unfortunately, it does erode the physician-patient uh, relationship because if you're delaying therapy and you're not making those, these are the type of patients that usually come back and think that and try to, uh, to lay the blame or some of the decision-making blame uh, back on their treating physician. And the other thing that this does is that over time, it erodes patients' uh, ability to stay on medication. So most patients are very good at staying on medications in the short term, but as I had alluded to before, when they're on therapy for a long term, they, they, te they tend to fall off. So this is looking at, for example, Imuran uh, use in a, in a group of patients from Greece, and you can see that at four years, only 26% of them were actually taking the medication as it was prescribed. So let's transition into sort of the current therapies of inflammatory bowel disease. So um, the, the things that you should think about as a patient, um, and we're going to concentrate on medical therapy tonight, is that there's what we call the induction phase. You're feeling sick. We want to get you better. That's the sprint. And then there's the maintenance phase, the keep you better. One of the, one of the things I always try to impart on patients is that most patients are pretty good in the short term. They all, you know, they're good at sort of saying, yep, I'll, I'll line up for the 100 meter sprint, and they take their induction therapy. Just like many people in the world, a lot of people don't like to run marathons, and it's the same thing for, pa for patients. They don't like to be on maintenance therapy. But it's this phase, the maintenance phase, that's probably the most important phase. Because every time you fail maintenance or you allow your disease to flare, it may be that flare that gets you into serious trouble, gets you into hospital, or maybe even leads uh, to surgery. So we want to try to control inflammation uh, as quickly as possible and maintain that. And by doing that, we introduce medications and we continue some sort of maintenance therapy. So we usually use the same type of therapy and maintenance as we do in induction. Uh, there are some, uh, some uh, uh, sort of challenges to this rule. And so it usually means drug therapy up front and drug therapy long term. But sometimes we can sort of de-escalate or decrease that drug therapy. But for most of you, you will require some sort of maintenance therapy. It's no different if you had high blood pressure where you go into your family doctor's office, I measure your blood, you get your blood pressure me measured, and they say, hmm, your blood pressure is elevated. You really have no symptoms at that time, but it's a number that says your blood pressure is elevated. The family doctor puts you on a blood pressure medication. Your blood pressure gets better. You still don't have any symptoms, but your, your numbers are now better. Well, if you take that person off the blood pressure medication, which is a hypertension is a chronic disease, you know that if they go back to the family doctor, those numbers are going to be bad. So again, this whole concept of maintenance therapy is extremely important. So this is the shopping list of IV, current IBD therapy for both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. So let's start with the 5-aminosalicylates or 5-ASA. Uh, they come under different brand names. Uh, the original drug was, uh, was uh, discovered over 60 years ago. Some of you may be on sulfasalazine. And this was used in rheumatoid arthritis. And some of the patients who also had ulcerative colitis were found to improve on this. So they knew that this had an anti-inflammatory effect on the, uh, on the intestine. Uh, but one of the problems with this drug was that it had side effects, and a lot of people couldn't tolerate it long term. So over the last 30 years, newer 5-ASA products with different delivery systems have been de developed. They have fewer side effects. Um, and the nice thing about these drugs is that most of the action is topical. It's like putting cream on a rash. You don't absorb a lot of these drugs systemically. They're mostly used for ulcerative colitis. In fact, the use of these drugs in Crohn's disease is becoming less and less because there's no good evidence that they work in Crohn's disease. They can be given either as an oral medication or as a topical medication, either as a suppository or an enema. 
the more you give, the better people tend to, to get. And you can use them to get you better and in mild to moderate ulcerative colitis to keep you better. So when do we use them? We use them for mild to moderate ulcerative colitis. Again, they can be given orally or topically. They can be given both in the short term or long term. They're extremely safe and they may decrease the cancer risk by controlling inflammation. The limitations to these drugs are because they're oral pills, sometimes you have to take many of these, there's compliance and adherence issues. Side effects are rare. About 10 to 15 percent of patients may not tolerate it. It may actually give you diarrhea uh, or abdominal cramping. So if you go on one of these drugs and you feel like you're flaring your disease, it may be that you're intolerant to the drug. It's not the disease itself. Uh, rash and headache can occur, uh, and headache especially at higher doses. And then there's rare side effects, including inflammation of the lining of the heart and sort of, this should say, lungs uh, and pancreatitis. Corticosteroids. So uh, we're going to just talk about if you're an outpatient, these can be given intravenously as well uh, in patients when they're in hospital. Uh, they're usually taken either as oral prednisone or a drug called budesonide or entacort. Uh, they tend to be used both for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis for patients who have moderate to severe disease or who have failed a 5 ASA. Their, their typical tapering regimen is to be given over a period of 8 to 12 weeks. You start with higher doses and you taper off of these slowly. There's a lot of red in this slide and these are very important messages to you as a patient. They're not for maintenance therapy or long-term use. In fact, it's, they've never been shown to be useful long term. They're also, which I'll show you, associated with most of the side effects that we don't like as physicians. So if you are acquiring more than one course of steroids every two or three years, you're likely on the wrong maintenance therapy. These are not maintenance drugs and they shouldn't be self-administered. Unfortunately, we see way too many patients that don't have adequate disease control that have a stash of prednisone at home and when they get sort of sick, they self-medicate. Well, again, this doesn't help us along the journey because we really don't know how sick you are. And if you're having to do this in your own disease management, it really means that your disease is not well controlled. And you should speak to your physician about that. Why do we use them? They're still one of the most effective get you better drugs. Uh, no drug therapy, old or new, has ever shown the, the induction rates as a good course of, of prednisone. They can be given orally or topically. They do work quickly and they're inexpensive, so cost is not a barrier. Some of the limitations are patient perception. We have a lot of patients that when you start to talk about steroids, even if they've never been on steroids, that they say, I'm not going to take this. Why? Because they've compared themselves to another patient who may have had side effects. Uh, about 30% of the patients who go on steroids will be dependent, meaning that they'll need to have some other drug. And a dependency may be disease dependency or drug dependency. And then there's a whole list of shopping of side effects. There's a higher risk of infections. This uh, prednisone has the highest risk of infection of any drug that we use. Uh, it can cause metabolic bone disease. It has metabolic consequences, has neuropsychiatric consequences. Some people get very emotional on them, difficult to sleep. Uh, I always tell the spouses, I said, you know, for the next eight or 10 weeks, don't forget this is still the person you married. Uh, just because they're going off the rails a little bit, it's the drug, so you need to be patient. Um, and they have body alterations. You can you develop what we call moon facies, weight gain, et cetera. So there are a lot of short-term and long-term limiting effects uh, with using these drugs. So for many years, we turned to immunosuppressant type drugs. Uh, the most common would be these drugs, azathioprine or 6 mercaptopurine which are known by the trade names imuran and purinethyl. They're global immunosuppressants uh, and the way you break these down or eliminate them is under genetic control. So the, you need to get the dose just right and part of do, doing that is testing the genetics of how you would break down these drugs. Um, they're a very good steroid sparing agent if you've required steroids repeatedly but they're falling out of favor in the treatment of IBD as a standalone agent because newer studies within the last three years shown that, show that they're only modestly effective. So 
Many of you may have been on these for years, but if you were a newer patient, many of us are skipping this step in your therapy and going to one of the newer medications because of some of the newer studies and because of some of the side effects we'll discuss in a, in a minute here. Why do we use them? We've been using them for over a quarter of a century, so there's a lot of physician comfort and experience. And depending on how experienced your physician is, they'll still use a lot of this drug. We also like to use them, though, with an anti-TNF, which I'll describe next, to decrease antibody production and enhance the way the drug works. Some of the limitations, 25 to 30 percent of patients can't tolerate the drug just for nonspecific intolerance issues, abdominal pain, nausea, rash. Um, it requires regular blood work monitoring. And again, they do have side effects. There's acute allergic type reactions, which account for most of the 25 to 30 percent that can't take them. Nausea is a big issue. Uh, we can get away around this. Um, I always dose these drugs at bedtime. The nausea associated with it usually comes on two hours after you take the dose. It lasts six to eight hours, so it makes sense. If you take it at night, uh, by the time the nausea would come on, you're sleeping. By the time you wake up, it's gone. And so if you're on this and you had to stop it for nausea, this is a little trick. Some people develop rash or a flu-like feeling, and 5 to 10 percent of them get an allergic reaction in the pancreas, and they develop pancreatitis. If you've ever had this, you would readily recognize this. It's a pain that sort of sits just above your belly button and goes into your back. Long term, there are concerns with this, these drugs. Uh, there's an increased risk of, lymph, uh, of infection uh, and lymphoma, which is a blood cancer. Uh, this blood can we estimate that this happens in about four to six uh, of ten, per 10,000 treated patients, and non-melanotic skin cancer. So even in young people, uh, the type of skin cancer that you see with a lot of sun exposure can be seen. So if you're on these drugs, you should be getting annual skin checks by a dermatologist and or your family physician. And because of some of the effects that they have on your immune system, you need routine blood work monitoring, which is a key to using these drugs safely. And so we recommend that, these, that you have blood work done every one to three months. Methotrexate um, is another drug that we use. Uh, it was actually uh, discovered here in Canada, and the clinical trials uh, were done in Canada. It can be either given orally or by injection. Uh, it's also a steroid sparing agent. But once again, it's falling out of favor as a standalone agent because of recent studies showing modest efficacy. Um, and it's, but we are using it more and more as combination therapy at low doses with some of these newer drugs because it's one of the better drugs to decrease antibody levels and increase drug levels even at lower doses. So many of my patients may be on three to five tablets of this once a week with an anti-TNF therapy and I always say that methotrexate is, is it's like the uh, warranty on your car uh, if you're taking one of the more expensive drugs. It'll, it, makes the drug, it makes the car work better and it makes it last longer. There are some uh, short-term side effects. The biggest one is nausea. It's important to notify your physician early if you have this. Um, also, you can get flu-like symptoms, rash, and diarrhea. In rare, there's some rare or long-term side effects. The biggest one in the early on is an allergic reaction in the lungs. So if you're taking this drug or start taking this drug and you have cough or fever, shortness of breath, um, notify your uh, physician immediately. Uh, there's a theoretical risk of infection and scar information, uh, scar formation in the liver, but this is rare in IBD. But when you're on this drug, you need to make sure that you limit your alcohol intake. You, make, you want to make sure that you're within your ideal body weight. If you have issues with diabetes or other things that can cause fat in the liver, this is a drug that you may not want to be taking. And once again, it's important to have routine blood work monitoring. And unfortunately, you can't take this drug during pregnancy. It's called teratogenic, which means it does have effects on the development uh, of the fetus. About 18 years ago now, uh, or 17 years ago, uh, we introduced anti-TNF therapy into the therapeutic armamentarium. These drugs, which are known, are, can be given either sub-Q, uh, such as Humira, 
IV such as Remicade or a newer anti-TNF called Symphony, which is also a sub-Q, have really revolutionized the way we treat both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And it's because these are very targeted therapy. They target a specific protein or molecule in your blood that's responsible for causing inflammation. They can be used as a steroid sparing agent or in patients who don't, uh, who uh, are steroid dependent. It can be used in patients who are not responding to steroids and that happens in about 30% of patients. Or it could be used in patients if you failed other traditional therapies. However, more and more we're using these drugs as first line therapy, especially in patients who've either had a poor past history with their Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis or have some of those worrisome prognostic features. And there's been a lot of studies that have taught us how to use these drugs properly over the last uh, 18 to 20 years. Uh, the most important thing is that these hit the target uh, that we're aiming for. They're the ro most robust agents that we have to heal the damage that we see uh, in the bowel. And this is just an example. If you have Crohn's disease and ever in, or have ever been awake during an, a colonoscopy and or seen your own pictures, you can recognize that this bowel is unhealthy. These, this white area here are deep ulcers. You can see that it looks swollen. Here's another look uh, uh, in this one particular patient of these deep sort of long ulcers. And surely if your bowel looks like that, it's not going to be very, very happy. With drugs like Humira and Remicade and Symphony, uh, what we can do is make your bowel look like this. So this is after 12 weeks of treatment with one of the anti-TNFs. And now this bowel looks perfectly healthy and happy. And certainly if we, can do, do, we have drugs that can do this, this would be our preference. We've shown that since we've introduced these drugs that we've been able to decrease uh, the rates of surgery. This is some data from here at the University of Calgary and ulcerative colitis. And the drugs were basically introduced in 2006. And you can see all of a sudden, right after they were introduced, boom, we see a decrease in surgical rates. So why do we use them? They're very effective. They meet all our treatment goals in 2015. And they've been shown to reduce hospitalization, surgery, improve quality of life. And they're really the closest drug we have that's been able to change the natural history of the disease. Some of the limitations are cost, misinformation. So people go on the internet and they read about all of these scary side effects that I'll talk to you about. So, there are minor side effects. There's an increased risk of minor infections. Um, if you're getting the infusion, you can get an infusion reaction. If you're doing an injection, there's reactions at the site. And we, we do see about in 15 to 20 percent some of these um, skin reactions. Most of you who've been on this or should, uh, should have had a TB skin test because if you were exposed to tuberculosis, it can reactivate it. There is a risk of lymphoma. It's thought to be about four to 10,000. Um, if you have established heart disease, it can worsen this, or if you have neurological damage, it can worsen that. And very rarely we can see serious or what we call opportunistic infections. But if we look at the risks and benefit of this drug, this probably has the greatest benefit and overall the lowest risk. But again, because patients go onto the internet, they hear about cancers, lymphoma, infection, and they have a very emotional response to that without knowing that all of these things that may be very concerning are extremely rare. So the last part of it is to look at sort of treatment algorithms. And this is something that we're very interested in uh, here at the University of Calgary. And because we know that there's, I just showed you, there's five classes of drugs, there's two different uh, disease states, there can't be that many treatment decisions that we can make. And so by using treatment algorithms, we want to minimize the variance of care out there for you as sufferers for inflammatory bowel disease. And in other uh, disease states, it's been shown that they're associated with better outcomes at a lower cost and it's a very efficient way. So several years ago, uh, academic centers, we'd say this is the way you should treat uh, Crohn's disease. You should start, you should identify the patients we're at a poor prognosis, you should use the most effective therapy early, um, and community gastroenterologists would say, 
no, that's too aggressive, that's not going to work, it's going to be associated with increased side effects. So more recently we did a trial where we just randomized patients, uh, took patients in community practices, in half of the practices we told them what to do from afar by just calling the patients and asking them if we were in remission and treating them more aggressively at an earlier time point or letting the other half do whatever their community physician would want to do. So this is just about really asking the patient, are you well enough, are you off steroids? Every 12 weeks we would call the patient. And if you weren't, and you were in the group that was in the algorithm, we'd change your therapy on you. So this did lead to increased use of immunosuppression and anti-TNF therapy over the two years that we looked at these patients. But look, it didn't do anything to symptoms. It didn't matter if you were use, you're were you going to see your community gastroenterologist and he was doing what he wanted to do, or we were trying to tell him you need to advance therapy. There were no difference in the symptoms of the patients. But if you look on the right-hand side of this slide, there was a 36% decrease in complications and a, or a 26%, and a 32% decrease in surgery just by using the right drug at the right time by making sure that the patients were in remission off steroids. And it was the most, so it's not what you do, it's when you do it. And this gets back to trying to make decisions in a timely fashion. And in this study, we saw no new safety signals if we intervened early. And this is just to show you what happens if you start somebody, for example, on an anti-TNF early and they have in pure inflammatory disease, they haven't developed any complications, the chance that we can continue to have that patient in remission, off steroids, without the need of surgery over a five to seven year time horizon is 90%. So when you go to eat at, say, a place like the Cheesecake Factory or any of these chain restaurants, the reason that things work out for patients, that you always get a good meal is because they fought, they've really perfected a recipe and they use it over and over and over again. It doesn't matter what city you, you eat in. And this is what we try to do, we want to try to do in medicine is to take the best evidence and apply it to you as patients. So the last thing is this whole concept of monitoring your disease. It's a very important, and we do this here in Calgary, is we monitor the disease, not just the symptoms. This may be blood work. It may be biomarkers. Some of you know what a CRP is. Some of you may get stool samples. It may be getting periodic endoscopy or radiology. And now we're doing therapeutic drug monitoring for some of the newer drugs. And so timing and tracking of these elements is important. And you should have these done at, depending on what you pick, either every month, every three months, or when it comes to radiology or endoscopy, maybe once a year. And this improves treatment decisions. It's been shown to improve treatment outcomes and potentially change the progressive course of IBD. So many of my patients know what their CRP is. They come in, they want to know that their disease is in control, even when they're feeling perfectly well. They understand that disease control is the cornerstone for success. And this just gives you an idea. If, you, For example, if you're a marker of inflammation in your blood was elevated, and you looked at this, looking back, the patients who had this elevation were, uh, were at increased risk, six-fold higher risk of requiring hospitalization. So if you monitor and you see this increase, if the patients, even if the patients are asymptomatic with no symptoms, but you are monitoring them and you can see that inflammation is starting, you can intervene and decrease this. So we do this routinely here in Calgary. So the last five minutes, I'm going to transition into what's new, what can you expect that's new. Some of what's new is going to be new next week. So this is what I call the therapeutic landscape of drugs that are in development for, um, for ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. The good thing on this is you see a lot of green dots. That means there's a lot of drugs out there, a lot of development programs, and we know over time that one, two, or three of these will be drugs that we can use uh, going in the future. Available next week commercially will be one of these new drugs that has just been approved uh, called vitalizumab or Intivio. One of the things that we know happens in patients with inflammatory bowel disease 
is that white blood cells, which cause inflammation and fight infection, are increased uh, in patients. They go through from uh, the blood, through circulating in the blood vessels into tissue where they cause inflammation and damage. The very interesting thing is that there's white blood cells that traffic to all parts of the body, but then there's white blood cells that traffic specifically to the intestine to cause inflammation and damage. And what we and the way that these white blood cells traffic to different parts of the body are because of proteins that are on the surface of these white blood cells. Think about them as like the radar uh, on a plane, uh, so that's the waiting to land. And what they so and what these sort of the radar on these white blood cells do is they interact with the landing lights on the surface of blood vessels. So they interact very specifically. So the radar interacts with the landing lights, and what it does is it allows these white blood cells to land on the sides of blood vessels, and then once they've landed, just like a plane tracks to the to the terminal, these white blood cells track into tissue and cause inflammation. So wouldn't it be wonderful if we could actually block the radar of these white blood cells so they couldn't land? And if they can't land, they can't taxi to the terminal or they can't get into tissue. And that's what vitalizumab is. It's a novel gut selective anti-inflammatory biologic that specifically blocks the protein or the radar on white blood cells that home specifically to the intestine. And by doing that, it decreases inflammation within the intestine. And so you can imagine because it's gut selective, it has very little in the way of, select, uh, of side effects. This drug is approved for both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease in the United States and Europe. It will be available for ulcerative colitis beginning next week uh, in Canada, and we anticipate it will be available for Crohn's disease hopefully by the end of 2015 or early 2016. Some of the other new drugs block pro-inflammatory cytokines or proteins that cause inflammation similar to uh, what we talked about with drugs like Humira, Remicade, or Symphony. Uh, the newest one is this drug called Eustachinimab, uh, which blocks a, a pro-inflammatory protein. Uh, this goes by the trade name Stellara. It's approved for both, ulcer it's approved for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. And we have had the capability of using this drug in an off-label use uh, thanks to one of the companies in patients who have no other uh, options. This drug has been studied uh, in Crohn's disease and uh, as well as its cousin drug with good effect. And the last, what we call big phase three program has just finished and it has very promising results. So I do believe within the next two years, this will be a drug that will be available for the treatment of Crohn's disease and it will be developed for the treatment of ulcerative colitis uh, as well. There are other oral drugs that are, um, I'll just sort of go through very quickly. Um, these have been approved in other disease states. Uh, the, the nice thing about these drugs uh, are they are oral. They're not an injection or an intravenous. Um, these are probably still three to five years away if they make it through the whole development program uh, for uh, both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And then there's this other novel mechanism that has been getting a, a lot of exposure just because uh, it, we've seen the best initial response and remission rates from a pill that we've ever seen uh, since the early steroid era. Um, and this is a drug that needs to be given uh, twice a day. Uh, and when this drug is given, it has, at least in this small study that was done in Italy and in Germany, very good rates of remission in uh, Crohn's disease, and we're eagerly uh, awaiting uh, the results of the final trial, which have just started and are being done in Canada. So in conclusion, it's important to create a therapeutic al alliance with your physician. Define what your treatment goals are. In part, this lies in the ph philosophy of your treating physician and your IBD team. There needs to be a lot of education. What I'm doing tonight is something that we do over and over again in the clinic when we first see patients. You want to develop a very strong bond with that physician, and when you do that, agree on treatment goals, agree on the therapies that are, getting, are needed to achieve those treatment goals, and agree that monitoring is, 
of disease activity is the cornerstone of good control. So one size doesn't fit all, but we are starting to use more clinical markers of disease severity and prognosis to guide your, our initial therapy. This treat to target or treat to inflammation using a systematic assessment and approach is gaining increasing, uh, increasing popularity. We do consider disease intensity and disease burden over time. And we want to make sure that once you actually find that recipe that works, that we don't mess with it. There are emerging strategies which are defining not only how to improve ways of managing patients and new therapies that I just outlined in the last five minutes of the talk will offer us more choice and greater treatment flexibility. One of those is on our doorstep at, at this time. But our task is always to use the right tr treatment in the right patient at the right time by exploring the evidence base, using best practice, optimizing our biologic therapy, and tailoring it to your own individual needs. And with that, I'll turn it back to Faye to vet any questions. Thank you very much for your attention tonight. Thank you, Dr. Penichone. Uh, now, before we get to the question and answer period, I wanted to remind everyone about our Gutsy Learning series and our upcoming Gutsy Walk. Interested in learning more about treatments, um, mental health, and the patient journey experience? Join us in person or live via webcast on Wednesday, June 24th from McMaster University for our second edition of our Gutsy Learning series. To learn more or to register, please visit www.gutsylearningseries.com. Again, that website's www.gutsylearningseries.com. Are you ready to make it stop? Join us on Sunday, June 7th at our 20th annual Gutsy Walk. Help us continue to tr transform the lives of children and adults living with Crohn's and colitis through research, patient programs, and advocacy. Join a walk in your community and show those living with Crohn's and colitis that they are not alone. To participate, fundraise, volunteer, or donate, visit www.gutsywalk.ca. Again, that website's www.gutsywalk.ca. And now, on to the question and answer period. We will now open the floor for any questions you may have. Um, so there's quite a few questions coming in. Um, one of the questions that I see here is, um, if uh, what, does, what does CRP stand for? So it was mentioned in the presentation, uh, CRP. And uh, this individual is asking for, for, for what it stands for. So CRP stands for C-reactive protein. It's uh, a marker in blood of inflammation. Um, it, it, there is some genetic, um, genetic control over this. So 20% of patients, even if you have an infection or inflammation, won't uh, mount what we call a CRP response. So the, the, it'll be normal even in the presence of inflammation. But uh, in the other sort of 70 to 80% of patients, when there's active inflammation, this is a marker uh, that will go up, uh, and it can go up, you know, even six to eight months before patients would get uh, would get symptoms from their inflammation. So it's a very good marker in those patients who produce it to uh, to monitor for recurrent inflammation. Okay, great. Um, Orly is asking, what is the best medication to take if you want to get pregnant in the future? Um, yep. So that that's her question. Yeah, so, so it's a great question, Orly. So I'll just step back. Um, the, the best medication is the one that, that gets you well and puts you into remission. So uh, in pregnancy, our mantra is that healthy moms make healthy babies. Aside from methotrexate, most of the drugs that I talked about, you can take right through pregnancy, including some of the newer biologic therapies. We stop usually in the third trimester. but you want to be on a therapy that gets your disease under control. There's, there's, you know, we don't really believe that there's safer drugs, again, aside from the toxicity of methotrexate. So um, if you're a Crohn's sufferer and you're on a drug that has you in control, just like we always say, don't stop that drug, 
because disease control is the most important part to a successful pregnancy. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question here, are low vitamin D levels common for IBD patients? If so, any, um, any opinions for increasing levels of vitamin D? Yes, yeah, so um, it just in Canada in general, we see, uh, we do see um, uh, decreased levels of vitamin D. Um, more and more we're routinely checking for vitamin D levels because uh, it's shown in other inflammatory conditions that um, supplementing vitamin D may decrease uh, inflammation. So you should have your vitamin D checked. If it's low, you should be supplemented. And that supplementation and how that's supplemented really depends on how low your vitamin D is. So if it's sort of just below the, the lower limit of normal, you can use sort of uh, 5,000 international units of vitamin D on a daily basis. If it's very low, sometimes we need to give very large doses of vitamin D to get uh, those levels up. And those are given sort of Monday, Wednesday, Friday for a period of four months. So there's, it really depends on what that vitamin D level is on how to optimize getting you back into the normal range. Okay. Um, Bobby asks, at what point would you lower the dose of Remicade? Uh, never. Okay. That, it's, so again, uh, these, drugs are, are, uh, these drugs are given for particular uh, reasons at particular doses in, and at particular intervals. So the only, the only time we would think about uh, sort of lowering a dose, and it depends on if, if you're talking about Remicade de taking less, is if you actually had levels that were too high. So we can measure levels. There are some sort of side effects that may be associated with higher levels. But if you're doing well and you're tolerating the drug, we usually like you to maintain the interval and the drug dose that you're on. Okay. Um, the next question here, uh, what are some other treatments, uh, treatment options if, if sorry, the, the page is scrolling so fast, there's so many questions coming in. Um, what are other treatment options if you haven't responded well to, to Remicade? Um, well, again, it depends if you have Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, and it depends on um, on whether or not uh, what not responding well to Remicade means. So it, I can go through sort of different scenarios. So there are patients who respond to Remicade very nicely and then lose response. Um, if you, in these patients, you may be able to again measure their drug levels and they may have developed antibodies to the drug and those patients are candidates to just to switch to say Humira. Um, there are other patients who are pr what we call primary non-responders. They just anti-TNF is not a or drugs like Remicade just don't work and that's not uncommon um, and if that's the case uh, and you have appropriate what we call levels and the drug's been optimized then your three options uh, now are would be to go into a clinical study if you're close to a study location. There's a lot of drugs that we're using in that situation. Uh, we will use off-label ustekinumab or Stellara uh, because of experience in that patient population uh, as well. And we hope that vitalizumab, the drug that I talked about in the end, will be available for Crohn's disease as well. So it, that's more of an overarching sort of response because the, what you would do would be specific to the patient's situation, uh, what disease they have, how they actually responded, didn't respond, and drug levels. So a little complicated. Okay, great. The next question here is um, this individual is asking about anti-TNF. Um, they're mentioning here that it's an expensive medication, and if they have been taking it and they, they stop taking it, uh, is there any immunity that's built up over time? Yeah, so that's that's the problem with it, and that's why again, we'll I'll go over and over again. When you find a recipe that works, don't stop it. So if you stop a drug like Remicade, um, there is a about a 20% chance if you tried to restart it, a it wouldn't work, or b you'd get uh, you get an infusion reaction. So 
we, we, it's like burning a bridge that you crossed, you got to the other side, um, you know, and you're on, you're on the good side of your disease and then you decide to cross back and burn the bridge. Um, so we don't recommend stopping therapy. Uh, you can try to go back on it, but again, in 20% of patients, uh, the experience is not going to be a good one. Okay. Um, this person is uh, asking about 5-ASA. They are saying that they know that there was a recall on one of the brands um, and uh, that there was a new drug released. Um, Okay, uh, how, and then they're asking, how often are these drugs tested? Uh, because they want to know more about it and they want to they use or try the drug. So they're basically concerned about recalls and they want to know how often new versions of them come out. Um, okay, so that's a little bit of a tricky question. So the manufacturer, it depends on the drug. Um, you don't usually get recalls of recalls of drugs like you get recalls of cars. Uh, sometimes batches. So all of all, where these drugs are made, and they're made in different manufacturing plants. Uh, there's quality assurance checks, and for whatever reason, if if the drug um, sort of chemical makeup of the drug falls out certain parameters, but that lot of drugs. So if you ever look on your prescription or your, if you look on the bottle, it'll give you a lot number as well, right? Where did the drug come from? Um, so that's, it's extremely rare that that happens, um, but there, there's uh, sort of uh, advice from Health Canada that these drugs get tested, that these drugs get, are tested uh, sort of serially. Um, so as far as, um, what I would say is as far as, uh, sort of recalls, they don't happen often, they do get t tested very, they, get, they do get tested very often, so when you see a recall it's extremely rare because most of, the, most of the manufacturing process, uh, they're passing uh, the, the regulations set out by Health Canada and or uh, the FDA or the jurisdiction that the drugs are being produced in. Okay, and I think we'll wrap it up with a final question here. Uh, this question is in regards to AZA. Uh, the individual is asking, does this um, treatment result in improved muscular healing versus anti-TNF? Uh, no, I mean, there's no, uh, so it, again, musc I, I guess I'd have to ask the question, uh, why the muscle is not healed if they're talking about surgery versus like if the muscle has been damaged from surgery or just overall. Um, the worst drug for healing to be on is prednisone. Um, the second one is an immunosuppressant suppressant like azathioprine and the last would be a drug like an anti-TNF. Uh, so there's no real concerns for abdominal surgery, for example, or healing when you're on an anti-TNF. And in our practice, we just continue to treat patients right through, even when they require surgery. Okay, great. Actually, sorry, we're just going to, there's one more um, question that's come in, and it seems I've, to be a popular question. I've seen this a few times. This individual is asking that uh, they have UC, and um, they've been in remission for quite some time now. Um, and they're asking that uh, if they are on 5-ASA, if um, any of the me medications should be reduced in dosage now that they've been in remission for quite some time. Yeah, so 5-ASA, in, in patients with mild to moderate ulcerative colitis, um, in, you know, our, our own personal practice is that if you're, because you're on first-line therapy, you can reduce uh, the drug. Um, I usually don't reduce below 2 grams or 2.4 grams of the drug, and you get one shot at that. So again, it depends on where your journey came from. If you were on steroids, for example, and you're now you're on 5-ASA, even if you've been in remission for a long period of time, I usually don't like to, to reduce you. If you've been on a lower dose and required a higher dose, I usually don't like to reduce you. But if you've been on a stable dose, that's the only thing you've been on, you've been in remission for a long period of time, and say you're on 4 grams or 4.8 grams of the drug, I do think that it's reasonable to reduce to 2 to 2.4 grams to try to maintain remission and see what happens going forward. Excellent. Thank you very much.
And that concludes our webinar presentation. Thank you to everyone for joining us this evening and uh, for the great questions. I especially want to thank our guest speaker, Dr. Remo, Remo Penicione, for your excellent insight and expertise uh, on uh, providing this presentation this evening. Also, thank you to Takeda for sponsoring this event. As mentioned, a recording of this webinar will be available on our YouTube channel at getgutsy, G-E-T-G-U-T-S-Y, in the fall.